Welcome to the first webinar from the Systems Thinking Specific Interest Group on the application of systems thinking for portfolio program and project managers. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and you are in a listen-only mode. However, participation with the content as we go through is strongly encouraged. Please do this by writing the questions in the question area of your dashboard. There will be a question and answer session at the end of this webinar where we will endeavour to answer as many as possible. After the webinar has finished, later today, you will receive an email providing the links for the APM webinar recording loaded onto our APM YouTube account and the slides will be loaded onto our APM SlideShare account, both of which will be listed on the SIG microsite page on the APM website. The email will also include a survey link and we do ask if you are able to over the next two weeks to follow this link and provide feedback on the webinar to improve those in the future. Please be aware that CPD certificates are not issued for webinars, therefore delegates should self-assess on their CPD records. I would like now to introduce you to the two presenters for this webinar today, David and Michael, both members of the APM Systems Thinking Specific Interest Group. David Cole is an experienced portfolio program and project manager and consultant who has worked primarily with technology-focused private and public sector organizations to both directly manage and advise on the management of their portfolio program and projects. He is a systems thinking SIG committee member. Also presenting today is Dr. Michael Eames, a senior lecturer at University College London, director of UCL Centre for Systems Engineering, and is co-chair of the APM Systems Thinking SIG. Now I'll hand over to you will introduce the agenda of the webinar today. So I'm just going to give you a, a quick overview in terms of the agenda to expect today. Um, I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes or so uh, about why systems thinking is important and what, in fact, system thinking is. I'm then going to hand over to David, who's going to talk about um, some examples of how system thinking can help portfolio, program, and project management, uh, including a case study. And then, as, as Maya said, uh, we'll look at some of the questions at the end. So, why do we believe that there's a need for system thinking? Let's start off by looking at the reductionist approach. We naturally try to break large problems down into parts that can be completed easily. This top-down or divide-and-conquer approach works well for simple projects like building a long wall. Most modern projects are much more complicated or intricate though, and the development of an integrated system like a car or an aircraft requires careful consideration of how we partition the system to design and build it. Modern supply chains are often internationally distributed, requiring careful mapping of activity to organizations and clear definition of responsibilities and interfaces. Many projects are harder still or complex in that we can't even agree about what the project's objectives or requirements are. For example, how do we define the objectives of a new school, transport system or health service? We wouldn't plan to host the Olympic Games without thinking about the use of the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure afterwards, the so-called legacy question that we heard so much about during and after London 2012. But traditional approaches to problem solving often lead to quick fixes which prove to be ineffective solutions that waste resources. Sometimes they even make the problem worse rather than better. System thinking helps us to identify the leverage points where interventions will have the greatest impact, not just straight away but over time. And system thinking makes sure we keep in mind the big picture or whole system performance and take into account all of the relevant factors, including the interests of a range of stakeholders when implementing change. This enables us to avoid solutions that are an aggregation of optimized subsystems but are ineffective overall due to the interactions between the subsystems. This way of thinking is increasingly being applied to the health sector in the UK with sustainability and transformation plans or partnerships, STP. Each STP gives collective responsibility to many organisations involved in delivering health and care services from acute care providers like major hospitals to county councils, mental health and community providers to ambulance trusts. In short, we need systems thinking because traditional, linear, top-down or divide-and-conquer approaches on their own are often unsuccessful for modern projects. For almost all modern projects, some form of system thinking will be helpful, but we believe that for projects that are not clearly defined or understood, it is essential if we are to avoid project failure. So on to the benefits of system thinking. The successful application of system thinking 
can improve the perceived quality of the delivered project or system. By engaging with multiple stakeholders, it helps us to ensure that the project delivers something that the stakeholders are ultimately happy with. But it can also help with avoiding schedule delays and keeping to budget. It does this by ensuring that we develop a clear definition of the problem and an understanding of why it is a problem. It enables users to see and understand what is going on in the system, its environment, and why the system behaves as it does. System thinking reveals dynamic complexity and can anticipate emergent behavior, i.e. behavior that is only revealed through the interactions between the system's components over time. Emergent behavior can be seen in human systems, such as when productive insights are generated by a well-balanced team, or in technological systems. For example, friction at a mechanical interface may cause unwanted wear, or incompatibility in software may lead to catastrophic failure, such as in the launch of the first Ariane 5 rocket. System thinking enables effective solutions to be identified and effective strategies established, together with clear objectives for their implementation. For example, by understanding how the solution will fit into its broader environment so that unintended consequences can be addressed before implementation. Systems thinking also encourages assumptions to be made explicit so that risks are more effectively identified, assessed, and managed. Systems thinking facilitates contribution and buy-in from a range of stakeholders for the identification of the problem and the proposed solutions. For instance, drawing causal loop diagrams helps teams develop a shared understanding of the problem and their place in it, and possible contribution to it, without apportioning blame. For broader audiences, systems thinking diagrams like rich pictures are effective for communicating problems and proposed solutions. So can we point to any concrete examples of successful application of system thinking? Dave will explore this in a bit more detail later, but as a taster, considering a few examples. In the private sector, application of system thinking, in one case, an organization that was enabled to streamline its supply chain costs. It not only reduced its costs from the highest in its industry, but also managed to increase revenues. This was done by reassessing its product line. In another private sector example, system thinking enabled a software company to move its 30,000 strong workforce from a who is to blame for this culture to a culture of how are we all contributing to the problem to significantly improve their speed and success for new product launch. In the public sector, on the other hand, application of system thinking enabled three local councils providing public sector services to reduce average end-to-end -end service delivery time by a factor of two while reducing costs by at least 10% and delivering better services. In addition, tangible knock-on benefits were provided to other public service departments. In a major acute hospital, UCL helped to apply system thinking to design the patient discharge process, so I should say redesign the patient discharge process, reducing by 41% the average length of stay for elderly patients with a combination of health and social care needs. As I said, some case studies that go into more detail on the benefits of system thinking will be discussed a bit later by Dave. So, I've talked quite a lot about the potential benefits of applying systems thinking, but it would be useful at this point to pause and clarify what we're talking about when we refer to systems and systems thinking. The word system is used in many different places and in inconsistent ways. It is often informally equated to a computer or other piece of information technology. We might hear, for example, that the system has gone down. Or sometimes system is used to refer to a governing process, such as in the statement, the system for admitting a new student involves. Neither of these casual uses really need the word system, though. So can we point to a respectable definition of the word system that helps our understanding? There are plenty of examples of products that have been developed to mimic nature, but let's assume for now that we are primarily interested in building a system rather than reverse engineering a natural system. In this case, the International Council on Systems Engineering, in COSI, definition of a system is useful. This sees a system as a combination of interacting elements organized to achieve one or more stated purposes. The elements of the system could be physical hardware, software, people, or even processes or activities. So a project can be thought of as a system. Now let's move on to explore the term system thinking. System thinking recognizes that the world is made up of interconnected, hierarchically organized technical and social entities, which often produce behavior that cannot be predicted by analyzing the behavior of the system's parts in isolation or indeed simply by aggregating the behavior of the parts. A system has emergent properties, as I alluded to earlier. Whenever we are interested in looking under the skin of some object or process to understand how it works, to understand how its elements work in concert or sometimes in conflict, to give behavior that is different to what could be achieved by the parts working independently, we are applying systems thinking. And the good news is that all project managers automatically will do system thinking at some level assuming they don't treat their projects as a black box, which I guess is pretty rare. But perhaps we are not doing as much system thinking as we could be. 
When defining systems thinking, we can distinguish between the definition of the purpose of systems thinking and the definition of the tools or activities involved. A good purpose definition is provided by Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline. This describes systems thinking as a discipline for seeing holes rather than parts, for seeing patterns of change rather than static snapshots, and for understanding the subtle interconnectedness that gives living systems their unique character. An operational definition of systems thinking uh, describes how it is implemented, seeing it as a set of tools or processes. This could include approaches to think about and frame dynamically complex problems, i.e. problems with interactions that vary over time. It could include diagrammatic tools to explore and map dynamic complexity, or perhaps a vocabulary with which to express an understanding of dynamic complexity, or methods to coherently apply the approaches and tools. Successful application of systems thinking requires a move in thinking from considering the system's component parts or elements to considering the system's structure, including not just its parts, but also the interconnections and interactions between its components. This is a change from the instinctive cause and effect thinking in which we assume a very simple relationship between an observed event, the effect, and an underlying cause. A metaphor we can use to understand the value of systems thinking is the iceberg. Events can be seen as outputs from systems at the tip of an iceberg of a deeper structure. Four levels are present in the iceberg, events, patterns of behavior, system structure, and mental models. We experience the world as a series of events, the symptoms of the problem. While some problems observed at event level can be addressed directly by treating the symptoms, many need deeper analysis. Patterns of behavior are identified by looking below the event level. Observing patterns enables events to be forecast and hypotheses on their causes to be developed and tested. Considering system structure identifies what is causing the patterns observed. Mental models are the attitudes, values, beliefs, and expectations that allow structures to function as they are. Sendi pointed out that the deepest insight comes when we realize that problems and hopes for improvement are inextricably tied to how we think. For example, if a hot tap is supplied from a water tank heated by a boiler, and the hot tap is open, but cold water is flowing out of the tap, we might reasonably assume that there is no hot water in the tank. Our intervention, if we needed hot water, would therefore be to turn on the boiler. But if the boiler has been running for half an hour and we try the tap again, and it still runs cold, we would realize that something else must be going on. In fact, this is a real scenario I face every day in my kitchen. The reason the tap runs cold is not because there's no hot water, but because there is a very long pipe run between my hot tank and my kitchen, and my water pressure isn't very high. So I have to let the tap run for about a minute before the hot water comes through when I haven't used it for a while. There is a delay between the cause, here opening the hot tap, and the effect, enjoying hot water in my kitchen sink. Only by recognizing that the system involves multiple interacting components and that behavior varies over time can I learn to operate it effectively. For the systems relevant to most modern projects, we need a broad definition of systems to include, to include people and policies that operate on and are impacted by the system. The overall performance of the system may be a nonlinear function of various aspects. Profitability, for example, may be dependent on many elements independently, such as product quality, leadership, level of competition, costs such as labor and materials, manufacturing equipment, advertising, and so on. Each component may impact and be driven by the others. We must appreciate that dynamically complex problems cannot be understood from a single perspective, and different viewpoints and contexts are necessary to properly understand them. Clearly, if a problem is not fully understood, it is unlikely that an effective solution will be identified and implemented. Different stakeholders will have different expectations of what good looks like for the solution, and all of these factors need to be weighed in designing an intervention. We will now explore a number of key approaches or philosophies that underpin systems thinking. Traditionally, systems are defined and developed using the approach of top-down functional decomposition, where the primary purpose or function of the system or product is defined and agreed, with all further definitions flowing from this. Decomposition continues until buildable components are identified. These components are built and integrated at increasing levels until the whole solution is obtained. This approach works well for problems with a single agreed cause or where there is no pre-existing solution that constrains the new solution. For most modern projects, however, the environment within which the proposed solution will operate may change over time. For example, a rail infrastructure project may be designed with a range of operating scenarios in mind, but with the understanding that the use of the assets may evolve over time. Projects are increasingly being required to anticipate future needs, and the more dynamic approach provided by systems thinking is needed. The key is to resist the urge to come to quick conclusions and to consider issues and their context fully. Clearly, efficiency is important as we want to make the best use of scarce resources. 
but consideration of the effectiveness of an intervention should come first. In systems engineering, we sometimes say that efficiency is concerned with building the system right, but effectiveness is about building the right system. Effectiveness is ultimately related to stakeholder satisfaction, so it can be expressed in terms of the recipients of the outputs from the system. We should seek to understand the bigger picture by identifying the patterns and trends generated as system elements and or system outputs change over time. Rather than focusing on particular events, static thinking, frame the problem in terms of patterns of behavior over time, dynamic thinking. We should recognize that a system structure generates its behavior. Rather than seeking understanding by focusing on the details, which you might describe as tree by tree thinking, we should appreciate that the context of relationships must be understood. You might call this forest thinking. We should explore the often circular nature of cause and effect relationships. Rather than assuming that the system's behavior is driven by external forces, this is system as effect thinking, appreciate that it is the responsibility of the internal actors who manage the policies and system operations for system behavior, system as cause thinking. The design of the system is likely to be part of the problem or the solution. We should make assumptions explicit and test them. Rather than seeking to prove models by validating them with historical data and or searching for perfect measured data, we should recognize that all models are working hypotheses with limited applicability. This is scientific thinking. And accept that while things cannot always be measured, they can always be quantified. Note the quote from statistician George Box that all models are wrong, but some are useful. We should change perspective to increase understanding. Systems cannot be fully understood from a single perspective. Complex problems are multifaceted and cannot be solved by any one actor or stakeholder view. Keep an open mind to different ways of seeing and doing things. Rather than viewing causality as running only one way, with each cause being independent, which is straight line thinking, regard causality as ongoing with feedback influencing causes and causes driving each other, which is closed loop thinking. Explore the time dimension to gain insights about what has worked before and what might be needed in the future. The way we define the world is through mental models based on our beliefs, values, and assumptions. We should appreciate the mental models affect current reality and expected futures. Rather than listing factors that influence, on, or influence or are corrected with some result, concentrate on getting at causality and understanding how behavior is generated. A number of frequently used systems thinking diagrams are explored over the next three slides. Diagrams are generally developed by individuals working within their project teams or sometimes by a consultant through a facilitated workshop. We've recently been undertaking some research to understand how widely used the various tools are, and results from this will be published in the next few months. System thinking fishbone diagrams are a variation of the standard fishbone or Ishikawa diagram. Standard fishbone diagrams are used in quality improvement and reliability engineering to explore cause and effect. Starting with a problem of interest or defect at the head of the fish, we explore all of the factors that might contribute to that. When using these for systems thinking, we may choose to distinguish between hard aspects, which are factors that are measurable, such as to do with equipment, timing, or factory space, and soft aspects to do with people's feelings, motivation, and reception. Rich pictures are defined as part of soft systems methodology. Rich pictures enable a problem situation to be explored from various perspectives to explore, to support discussion, and to enable us to form a shared understanding. There are two example diagrams here, and the lower one is actually a rich picture developed for a system thinking study into the process of discharging patients with complex needs from acute hospitals that I referred to earlier. Actor maps depict the key organizations and roles that make up and are affected by the system. These are similar to rich pictures, but focus on actors and their relationships. An extension is a policy structure diagram which focuses on how an organization weighs factors at various decision points and the roles in the organization that define these weights. Concept maps or mind maps represent knowledge concepts of a topic. We start with the main concept and break this down to show its subtopics. The relationship between these are articulated on the links, for example, causes or, or contrib contribution to that factor. Trend maps depict the trends influencing the system. Trend maps are developed using the collective knowledge of people familiar with the system and its context. A trend map over time is useful to visualize important activities, changes in other events, to identify potential contextual factors, for example, political, economic, social, or technological. A variation on the trend map is, is, trend map is the cumulative sum or Q sum chart from the total quality management world, which can be used to monitor a process based on averaging samples at a given time. Causal loop diagrams represent the causal relationships 
between system elements and identify reinforcing and balancing processes or positive and negative feedback. These can be formalized into system dynamic models or stock and flow diagrams, allowing us to compute the values of levels or stocks in a system over time. These are very relevant in helping to anticipate the rate of progress in a project and the cost of changes introduced into a project. They've even been successfully used in litigation to settle uh, disputes over responsibility for cost overruns. For example, Ingall Shipbuilding sued the US Navy for $500 million in the late 1970s, blaming the customer's design changes for the supplier's difficulty in completing the project on time and to budget. System dynamics was used to settle the dispute, and in June 1978, the party settled out of court with Ingalls receiving $447 million in compensation, around 95% of the amount claimed. The lower diagram here is a simple version of the rework cycle, which is an important system dynamic model which can be used to explore the cost and schedule impact of low quality work in a project, something that affects many projects. Note that this is not an exhaustive list of system thinking diagrams. Where other tools are found to be helpful to provide insight, they should of course be used. One question you might have is whether other tools you use like Gantt charts or network charts are system thinking tools. The answer to this is that they certainly can be thought of as such if you're taking systems thinking to mean any thinking that recognizes interdependency. They are what you might call tools for hard systems thinking. Hard systems thinking doesn't mean difficult systems thinking or systems thinking for really tough problems. Rather, it means a type of systems thinking where the objective or end result can be taken as given. It is closely related to operational research or the approaches for optimizing well-defined problems. Hard systems thinking can be contrasted with soft systems thinking, where the end goal cannot be objectively defined, with different stakeholders seeing things differently. The system thinking method typically involves a number of steps, which can be grouped into three broad headings. The primary tools listed are intended as an initial suggestion based on the core system thinking tools typically used and described earlier. Other tools should be used where these are appropriate to the situation, in that they can provide insight into the situation or problem. Those are the three main steps shown here, map well to the three steps in Seddon's check, plan, do cycle, adapted from Deming's earlier work on quality management. The first step is to reflect on the situation or define the as-is situation. The primary activities here are to describe and understand the bigger picture and define the system boundaries, to identify and describe the cause and effect relationships between system elements, to develop a conceptual model of the problem and test this on the problem causes, to consider issues fully and resist the urge to come to quick conclusions, change perspective to increase understanding, as discussed earlier, and to iterate as necessary. The second step is to design the intervention. The primary activities here are constructing and testing hypotheses for solutions to the problem, defining the to-be that addresses the problem, developing the conceptual model of a new system, making assumptions explicit and testing them, considering issues fully and resisting the urge to come to quick conclusions, and changing perspective to increase understanding and finally iterating as necessary. And the final step is to implement the change or the to do to be solution. Here we compare the as is and to be conceptual models to define the changes required. We define the changes that are both desirable and feasible that will be implemented. We define the portfolio, program or project to implement the changes, including any necessary documentation. We implement the changes by implementing the portfolio, program or project we communicate the changes being implemented, and we transition the solution into operation. Having given you a quick summary of some of the main ideas behind system thinking, I'm now going to hand over to Dave to explain how system thinking can be used in project management. Thank you. Um, I will talk about, uh, as Michael says, how we might apply systems thinking to portfolio programs and projects, um, and then look at a case study, and then summarize and come to some conclusions. Um, so, overall, how might systems thinking support portfolio programs and projects? Well, really in three areas. Making sure we do the right portfolio program or project, make sure we do the portfolio project right, and make sure we maximize any outcomes and minimize any unintended consequences. Um, in terms of doing the right portfolio program or project, understand the full scope of the problem. Um, this not only makes sure we, we do the right uh, piece of work, but it increases our credibility with our management in organizations, enables us to put a clearer business case together, and once the uh, piece of work has started, better explain what it is and why it is and how it is, 
uh, to new people coming on to the project to make sure that there's less diffusion of objectives uh, once the work starts. The kind of tools that will be useful here are the fishbone diagrams, trend maps, and rich pictures. The greatest stakeholder engagement that uh, systems thinking tries to encourage and in some sense requires gives a better shared understanding so that that helps get us to the full scope. And probably the important word there is a shared understanding of the people doing the project and the people receiving the project. Um, particularly useful because it will help us flush out the unknown knowns and the unknown unknowns uh, so that uh, those can be tackled at the beginning and don't come as nasty surprises later. It will also help us identify win-win situations, and we'll see an example of that later. And implementing the portfolio program or project right, you know, because we have a better view of, of the, the full scope, we can have better planning, our progress reporting anticipates problems and copes with any complexity, so they become more accurate again, we have more credibility. Um, we have better forecasts. Uh, and so uh, hopefully we're taken more seriously. It's probably also worth pointing out at this stage that in itself, the systems thinking won't save money or reduce the number of people on a program that are needed at the beginning. However, the number at the beginning will be right. So um, it's a cost avoidance approach that um, reduces nasty surprises later. Uh, so do it right from the beginning. Maximizing outcomes and minimizing unintended cons consequences, having broader stakeholder involvement, understanding the full scope, uh, understanding why that scope is appropriate. Uh, will help us identify any knock-on effects and also improve any transition approaches or, or drive our transition approaches and get the, uh, the results accepted and handed over, hopefully first time, because we haven't missed anything that's important to our state. So that's an overview. Uh, I'm now going to quickly look at specifics to portfolios, programs, and projects, starting with portfolios. Um, at the top of the slide there, we have the APM body of knowledge definition of a portfolio in terms of the collection of programs and projects that an organization has in order to achieve its objectives. <clears throat> and we can look at that really in two directions. We can look at it bottom up, really starting the portfolio, where there's a, an amount of uh, work going on and we need to put those together so that on the one hand there is a coherence across that portfolio and on the other hand that coherence is aligned with the strategic objectives of the organization. In the other situation, more of a top-down situation where we have a portfolio and we are deciding either to implement it through a series of programs and projects or we want to extend the portfolio maybe having additional strategic objectives or changing work that's going on. Um, we can use systems thinking to help us decide what we need to do in the portfolio. We, in the bottom-up situation, we can understand more clearly how the different projects align with the objectives and, and look at would the objectives be better achieved by combining projects, or maybe even deleting projects. Uh, how big are the projects that we've got? Are they appropriate to be managed uh, as projects, or should we manage them as programs? So looking at alignment with the objectives. Although portfolios are quite often, by their nature, have disparate parts, so a portfolio whole is probably more in terms of the organization looking out from the portfolio rather than necessarily looking in. What are the relationships of the portfolio and its constituents with external elements, particularly things like legislative changes, 
other things going on in the broader world and how should the portfolio uh, respond or maybe influence those? What kind of governance should it have? While there's going to be an overall single governance mechanism for the portfolio from an organizational point of view, what kind of sub-governance should there be in terms of the various stakeholders involved and the, their stakes and the cause and effect relationships between the different elements? And we can use a systems thinking analysis to, uh, to help throw some light on that and understand what the bigger picture is and, and the effectiveness of the government. Um, as I say, assessing changes. Portfolios are likely to have a quite a long life, in, in years at least. And so they are going to change over time and we need to understand uh, how we develop them and what projects being completed. Um, how that will impact the portfolio, changes to the organization's objectives. Um, and then sort of last but by no means least, assessment of what has gone well within the portfolio and what needs improving. How can the organization and the portfolio learn from what it's done so far so that it can do uh, its future work both more effectively and more efficiently. Moving on to programs. Program, again, the APM body knowledge definition of the program at the top. Um, and this is maybe where we move into some of the more um, standard program project management techniques. If we were using um, MSP, Managing Successful Programs, um, a lot of what, was, what I'm about to talk about will be described in the program blueprint. And systems thinking, I think, can help to develop that program blueprint and make sure that it's um, relevant to both the program and probably more importantly the, the, the various stakeholders who are the recipients of the program. <coughs> um, programs focus on outcomes, that is um, multiple objectives that include uh, typically um, people, the technology, the rollout and all the policies and processes required in order to make whatever the changes that the program is doing uh, successful and deliver benefit. And um, systems thinking can help us understand the scope, the full scope, make sure that the objectives are coherent. Um, again, programs uh, can have multiple objectives and while they will all be aligned into a whole, they may not necessarily all flow from each other or the structure, and systems thinking can help us understand that whole. Again, um, understanding dependencies, uh, again, within the program, but also on external elements. Understand the impacts on the stakeholders, what are the natures of their stakes, um, how can they be helped and brought into the program. Um, the story of the Crossrail director who was initially um, not regarded as a friend by most of the people who were going to have uh, trains running under their areas, um, used analysis and uh, ended up being asked to give the Christmas prizes at a number of local events. Um, what's the transition for the program into its sort of the business as usual operational approach? Um, looking at the various perspectives, uh, making the assumptions explicit and focusing on effectiveness of the final results and the transition. Impact on external changes, understanding the bigger picture, uh, again changing perspectives and again last but by no means least understand how the program can learn. It's likely to have uh, a life of probably uh, years certainly longer than, uh, than months. Moving on to projects, again, APM body of knowledge, definition of a project on the top there, and systems thinking can help make sure that the project has a clear definition of its scope and objective. It's likely to be much more focused if we take um, a print kind of view of a project is producing outputs which will then be put together with other outputs uh, in order to produce outcomes. 
So understanding what those outputs should be specifically. So I'm really going down to the bottom of the uh, of, of the uh, portfolio program project stack to deliver the components from which uh, the overall benefit will be will be will be achieved. Um, again, dependencies, uh, the project internal and external elements. Uh, in this case, probably more focus on the project internal um, than external, as we've seen with programs and portfolios. Uh, understanding impact on stakeholders, transition planning, and assessing what went well, so that that can be fed into programs and portfolios if the organisation. Um, has programs. Um, finally on the list there, we think systems thinking can help assess and diagnose failing projects. Um, the APM list of common reasons why projects fail, uh, of insufficient commitment to project sponsors, unclear requirements and or scope, inexperienced team members, not inexperience of project management, poor planning, um, lack of a formal project management process, cultural issues, unclear roles and inadequate communication. Um, we would argue that systems thinking can help in all of those cases except possibly um, lack of formal project management processes and inexperienced team members. The others, um, we think systems thinking can help significantly so that if projects do fail, they can be brought back on track and the lessons learned uh, for future projects. Um, we're now going to look at a case study. Um, this comes from um, a report produced by the Wales Audit Office uh, looking at systems thinking. It's a systems thinking case studies report um, looking at systems thinking in the public sector. It's fairly old in that it was published in January 2010 by the, uh, the Lean Enterprise Research Centre. Um, but I think it pulls together a lot of the kind of topics that we've been talking about so far. The report describes three applications of systems thinking. Um, Neathport Tolbert County uh, Borough Council looking at their Disabled Facilities Grant Service. The Blenow Gwent uh, County Borough Council looking at housing and council tax benefit service and Portsmouth City Council looking at their housing management service. Um, we're going to fo focus on the Portsmouth City Council um, example um, because it covers more of the points that we want to make. Um, thoroughly encourage everybody to go and read the report. The link will be uh, given at the end of of the slide set. Um, probably also worth pointing out that as we go through the case study, we'll see that there's other things beyond the kind of systems thinking tools and approaches that we've talked about so far. Um, there's elements of business process re-engineering and there's also significant lean elements in there. That's fine. Um, systems thinking would want to take those and give them a, uh, a sort of a framework within which to operate. So background on the case study. Um, Portsmouth City Council, unlike many local authorities, retains management, direct management and ownership of its housing stock. And as we'll see in a moment, that's actually very important here. They have about 17,000 um, dwellings, um, a budget of 80 million and a staff of about 600 people. So it's, it's a, it's a, a non-trivial undertaking. In July 2006, the Audit Commission came and audited them and said the council overall was doing very well. Uh, they were given beacon status, so others uh, would look to them as uh, good practice. The repairs and maintenance service was rated good to start with promising prospects for improvement. So actually, pretty good news. However, the head of housing management was regularly accosted by local councillors saying that um, a lot of their um, constituents are complaining that they wait too long for repairs to their council houses. 
So they looked at the council survey. And the survey said 98% of residents were happy, and the council's KPI said repairs were being carried out within budget. So maybe the first question to ask here is, is there a problem? Um, we could jump to our um, stereotypes, which is maybe another, another name for mental model, but well, residents are never happy, are they? And councillors are always worried about their voters. Um, the audit commission says we're doing well and we're going to improve. We haven't got a problem. However, much to his credit, the head of housing management decided to investigate further, spoke with colleagues, and um, learned about systems thinking, went on a systems thinking course, so really he could understand, do I have a problem here? Um, I'm going to jump on. Clearly there was a problem, because actually if there wasn't a problem, we wouldn't be using it as a case study. But the kind of benefits that were found so that we can see those while we look on the next slide of the project approach and then the systems thinking uh, elements that were applied. Initially, the purpose of the system was to manage all activity in order to meet targets and keep down costs. Um, I don't think anybody would disagree with it. But it's not going to make you jump out of bed every morning and when you turn up as, say, a plumber to fix a problem, it, you're probably going to interpret it as do as little as possible. They were averaging 24 days for repairs, um, with 60% of the calls to their call center asking, what's going on? You've come and looked at something, but when is it going to be finished? However, their um, customer satisfaction surveys were running at 98%. They found that actually customer satisfaction, uh, they defined as were the workmen friendly and did they clear up afterwards? Well, they were friendly and they were clearing up afterwards, but actually they hadn't finished the job. So the council assessed that actually the true satisfaction was probably only about 60%. Um, when they redesigned the system, the main change uh, from a systems thinking point of view, and I think from an overall point of view, was they changed the purpose do the right repair at the right time. It's clear, it was easy to understand what that means, and it does make you jump out of bed in the morning to go and do things. Um, they, are, uh, sorry, they reduced their average fix to just under seven days, and for other things that they found, uh, about 12 days, so half what they were taking to repair initially. They found that they cost um, reduced so by 7% and actually they, as they were now doing more work the additional costs they found were actually covered by the falling costs and then other knock-on uh, cost reductions. So significant improvement. Now jump on to the approach they used for the project. Um, Really, the approach that we've just been describing, a check, plan, do approach, understand the as is, understand what, or define the solution and understand what that is, and look at how you might transition it, and then implement it. So, so they are very standard kind of uh, project. In terms of the purpose, the team um, got the requirements, and maybe the requirements should be in, in quotes, what is the system for, by listening to phone calls, uh, in the call centre, and I'm listening to people talking to residents at the reception centre. So understanding what do you want from uh, the housing repair service. The demand, how often and what kind of uh, things are people coming in. Again, they uh, listen to the calls and observe the reception counters. We then looked at how the system was performing. Uh, what was the capacity of the system? And they found actually um, what was going on was pretty predictable and pretty reliable. And then they mapped the flow of work so they could understand how tasks flowed through the system and how it related to the KPIs that they used. And um, they found some significant areas of improvement there. They then went on to plan 
the solution or the, the improvements that they needed to do and borrowing from the lean world, uh, trying to understand, well, what is the value? And that value from the customer, the residents, uh, certainly initially. So ensuring they had access to the property, they found that a significant number of um, requests didn't run to completion because they came to have a look and see what the problems were and they couldn't get into the property because they'd arranged the time to come and visit when the resident. So arranged times when, when the resident is going to be there. Properly diagnose the problem. Um, they found that a lot of uh, tradespeople went to go and fix problems and found actually it's not that problem, it's something else. So make sure they diagnose the right problem and then make sure they complete the repair there and then so that the tradespeople that go and do the work have a full set of uh, spare parts in their van. They also found that um, they could, by being more responsive and repairing everything that needed to be repaired in the property rather than just what had been asked for, they found that actually they would better maintain their properties. You know, while it might be the resident asking for taps to be fixed, the taps still belong to the council. So by repairing everything that needs to be done, they're looking after their own properties. Um, and then the implementation report doesn't really talk about the implementation much, other than implies that they rolled out the new process and then modified their IT systems to, uh, to support that new process so they could start giving benefit um, sooner rather than later, and they could learn from the new process and improve that. So how did they apply systems thinking? So using the iceberg and then looking at approaches and, uh, and tools as we go through, events. They categorize events as value events, I need something done, or failure events, I, you've come to do something but it's not finished. And they found that their failure events were 60% of all demand and they were going through their call center, so more than half of their call center was being used to address problems that, in, uh, in effect, they had produced in the first place. Uh, as I said earlier, they found that this 98% of residents were happy was because the workmen were friendly and did clean up after them. They weren't actually asking their residents, did they fix what you needed to be fixed? In terms of patterns of behavior, their assumption was that Everything is unpredictable. We can't predict when uh, people were going to ring up to ask for uh, leaking taps to be fixed. When actually, when they looked at the events that had happened, they found the demand was actually very predictable by time of year, month, and even day. Um, they also found that people going out to fix things um, were only fixing what had been asked for in large part because each patch had a monthly spend. They assumed that future demand was unpredictable, so they didn't want to spend more than they possibly could now because they didn't know whether they needed it later. Actually, that was based on a false assumption because forward demand was predictable. They looked at the structure, in particular the KPIs, and found that actually none of the KPIs were related to the performance of repairs. They were, they were related to busyness in terms of how many activities, how much budget are we spending. Uh, it didn't really relate to are we actually fixing what people need fixed. Um, and to make matters in a sense worse, repairs only undertaken on the problem reported showed that that didn't actually save any money because there were many um, repairs that had been done multiple times tap washers, for example, when it would have been far cheaper just to put a new tap in in the first place. They then looked at their mental models, or brought all of this together. So what does this mean in terms of our mental models? The starter purpose was do things to make sure we meet the targets and don't spend too much money. And change that to do the right repair at the right time, which is really the purpose of the, uh, the housing maintenance. They saw that they were originally guarding their skilled staff, and that's why a lot of the diagnoses were wrong. And yes, there are very few of them, and they are relatively expensive in relation to others,
but using them properly for the skills that they have to do diagnoses um, not only uh, reduces the times to do repairs, but makes sure the residents are happier because the right repairs are done, plus any others that are found. And they found, they also realized that their mental model that mm, not sure we can trust our tradespeople was entirely wrong. Um, if you're going to operate the right repair at the right time, the vans need to have lots of spares for lots of different repairs. Actually, if you don't trust your tradespeople, you should probably get different ones. So those were the three main mental models that they changed, which then sort of worked their way back up the iceberg uh, to affect the events and make sure and, and result in them being significantly improved. Now we'll draw some conclusions, and Michael will probably jump in as well. So summarizing, systems thinking is a, a discipline with a small d to address problems that can't easily be tackled with top-down decomposition. In the, um, the case study example, where's the top? Uh, and then how do you decompose it? They did decompose it, but it, it wasn't a top-down decomposition. It's a complex problem that involves a lot of people uh, with different views. And it wasn't even clear that there was a problem. In the first and, and just picking up on a, a question that uh, Daksha asked, um, actually systems thinking can be used right at the very start to try to understand um, whether it's a problem at all and, and looking at different people's perceptions of a situation uh, can really help make sure that the project starts off on a sound foundation so that you can go on and have a much better chance of success later. So applying system thinking right at the start to understand yeah whether it's a problem is, is... So what is it? It provides a framework for seeing holes. Because if you don't see the holes with a W, your project is probably going to have holes without. Really three main elements, approaches to understand the dynamic and, and frame dynamically complex problems. It can be applied to non-dynamically complex problems, and I think we would thoroughly um, suggest that. But particularly dynamically complex problems, probably about the only way to address them. The, the diagram tools, of which there's a staff effect that, uh, that we've described, and then the methods to coherently apply both those approaches. And again, just picking up on another question um, from Keith, um, he was questioning whether the main value of system thinking is more about understanding the emergent properties uh, that may come from a system rather than the interfaces or the interactions that we talked about quite a lot in the slides. And what I'd say to that is that the emergent properties are the reason for having the system in the first place, if you like. It's the benefits of putting the parts together that give you more than you get from the parts in isolation. That's why you have the system. Um, but some of the negative emergent properties um, you know, that end up with, with friction, with cost overruns that weren't anticipated, for example, um, they're obviously critical as well but they come from the interactions and the unanticipated interactions between the parts. So I, I, I would agree with the question and the comment that the emergent properties are, are crucial to understand, but I would also say that the emergent properties come about from the interaction, so it's, uh, it's important not to lose sight of that as well. I mean, they're sort of inherent part of the system. And from an um, APM point of view, um, very applicable to portfolios, programs, and projects to make sure we do the right one um, make sure we do it right and we see these unintended consequences which um, negative emergent properties at the beginning and we can uh, address them as part of uh, the work that we're doing. So com some conclusions. System thinking doesn't replace top-down decomposition. Um, it does, certainly doesn't replace divide and conquer decomposition as an approach, it can complement it, and in some cases, complex uh, dynamic problems um, is the way to understand what the quote top unquote is. Um, it doesn't also significantly change the project approach. Uh, it's part of the project approach, and as I was pointing out, sort of going through in terms of the current program and project uh, documentation sets in 
program terms. Uh, if you're producing program blueprints, it will help you produce the program blueprints. Um, if you're using prints with project plans and project initiation documents, it will help you put those together. It enables consideration of the element structures, interactions, and mental models. Leverage increases the further through this, that list you go. It's the mental models that uh, give you the most leverage in terms of, uh, in the case study, we're not just here to meet the targets and spend as little as possible. Actually, we're here to do the right repair at the right time. And if we do that, um, we'll do far better than just meeting the targets and not spending much money, and all our residents will be happy as well. The com core complex systems need multiple perspectives and contexts. Uh, again, in the case study, the context of the external people, the audit commission said you're doing fine. Um, the internal view of um, the KPI said you're doing fine. Um, some of the residents, in terms of their feedback and, and, and what they're asked, they're saying you're doing fine as well. Um, but only by changing that context um, to, to what do the residents actually want, what do the local councillors think, does it identify a problem, and then addressing that problem gives the win-win situation where the council is looking after its properties better and the residents are getting a much more responsive. Final comment, um, system thinking isn't a shortcut. The, you know, the first of the approaches, keep calm and don't jump to conclusions. Um, is probably a, a good soundbite summary of what systems thinking is. Make sure you understand what's going on. Systems thinking is there to help you understand what is the problem, understand what is the solution, and what are, what are the implications and ramifications of the solution. And the benefit is realized when the principles and tools are thoroughly and particularly thoughtful thoughtfully applied. It is called systems thinking, after all, and the thinking element is. So that's what all we wanted to say. Um, there's some references and some further reading. Um, thinking systems, a primer, um, good start. Looks very much at dynamics. The fifth discipline, um, one of the uh, publications that started systems thinking in the form that we're describing. Um, system thinking, system practice um, is what started the soft systems uh, methodology. The Wales Audit Office report that we uh, uh, described is the next reference, and I thoroughly encourage you to, uh, to go and have a look at that. Uh, the other two case studies are uh, very interesting as well, arguably in parts more relevant to systems thinking. Uh, the main difference is those two, the other two um, problems were identified at the beginning. Um, the Portsmouth case, it wasn't clear that there was a problem. Um, and then the, the, the last three there are the uh, examples that we gave at the beginning. A um, couple of websites. The Systems Thinker is um, a website with a lot of very very good uh, documents and articles, papers on it. And the systems practitioner is a blog, is fortnightly-ish, with uh, interesting reflections on the practice of systems thinking. Uh, maybe I should point out it's not my blog. Um, and then our um, APM and Cozy SIG website on the bottom there. Our email, our Twitter, and our LinkedIn. Um, contact addresses. Please, if you're interested, come and get involved. Um, if there are questions that come up um, after you've gone away from today, um, we'd love to hear them um, through the website. Questions, please. Thanks, Dave. Um, I've tried to pick up on a couple of the questions as you were summing up there, Dave, but there are a couple more that I think uh, I'd like to just address. I think that would be quite valuable, although I'm conscious of time. Um, so there was a question from Michael asking about um, how many, you know, knowing how many people managing projects actually use systems ideas would be helpful. 
uh, I mentioned some proposed research earlier. And at this stage, um, I'm not going to say more um, because I'm hoping to publish shortly a report summarizing the research. And there's also a survey going out through, through uh, with Wellington, the state of um, the annual state of project management survey, which has got a couple of questions that relate to systems thinking, which I'm hoping to integrate into the findings. Uh, and yeah, so watch this space over the next few months. And we hope to be publishing some findings in terms of um, how, you know, which techniques are people using and how much are they using them in projects. So that's uh, that one. But I mean, it's not part of project management training and courses. No, and that's, there's another. So there's, I was going to pick up actually on a couple of other questions. So how is systems thinking different to good project management? Um, uh, that's a good question. It's. And we sometimes get the same sort of question uh, relating to systems engineering and how is it different to good engineering. And what I would say to that is that the sorts of things that you would naturally do as a good project manager or as a good system engineer are actually, um, they, they do overlap significantly with what we would call systems thinking techniques. Um, but when we're talking about systems thinking, it's it's really about sharing with you the toolbox and the full range of techniques and where you may not be aware of, of all of the things that might be useful to you. So we've, we've tried to uh, mention a few today. There are many more that you, uh, you might think of as, as broadly relevant to systems thinking. And um, it's, it's really about trying to encourage people to to actively engage with it and to use it and to look for new ways of thinking systemically. And uh, a question from Joe was a little bit related. It's saying well, systems thinking has been around for a long time. Will it ever become mainstream? Or, or what are the barriers or enablers for this? And I'm hoping that we will be able to, at some point, get, get some more um, awareness of systems thinking and more uh, content on systems thinking into the APM's body of knowledge. I think that would be a, a great achievement if we could get that, um, even if it's only a small amount. I think it's showing to the APM community that this is what what is thought to be um, amongst the useful techniques in enabling successful delivery of projects, I think would, would greatly help its uptake and, and, uh, and that's something we're pushing for in due course. But you're right to say that it's been around a long time. I think we're probably out yeah, of time. Yeah, just but did you go ever... back to the um, how is systems thinking different to good project management? Yep. Um, I think that's a very good question. Um, in a sense, if you're used to applying systems thinking or systems thinking type approaches, I think the answer is probably little. There's little difference. Um, which isn't to say that if people are not applying, they're doing bad project management. I, I think once you start using it and see the benefits, then you keep using it. And it just becomes, this is how I do my project management, and it's good project management. It's not, unfortunately, yet standard project management. And I think there's, the other thing I would add to that is that there's, the different techniques that are part of systems thinking can be used in different places and you don't have to use every single technique that we've introduced here to be a, a good project manager. No, no, uh, and, no. And you know, if you wanted to use rich pictures early on in the project to understand your stakeholders better, fantastic. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that um, you're not a great project manager if you don't also apply system dynamics oh. to try to anticipate the you know, possible cost um, overruns. Absolutely. Um, and of course, it depends on what kind of project. Is it one where you know, the objectives are clear and you know how you're going to do it? Um, systems thinking will help, but it probably won't give you any significant insight. The other extreme where you've got a project where you don't really know what the objectives are, or there's a lot of disagreement, different, different views on what the objectives are, and you're not really sure where to start, systems thinking will give you hopefully a lot of insight. Okay. I think that's uh, thanks all for today then. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and you should be able to get access to the recording, the webinar through uh, YouTube channel in yep. due course. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.